time for another Zoom chat, everybody. We're talking whiskey and uh, a crazy world that we're living in right now amid uh, COVID-19. And we got my good buddy, Nick Nagley from Whiskey Acres in DeKalb, uh, another awesome quarantine beard. Uh, I continue to tell my guests that have those badass beards that I'm very jealous. I just kind of grow like this dark, somewhat gray, scruffy stuff. And I end up clipping it down about once a week. I don't think I could quite pull off that look, but it looks good, my friend. Carm, I can't do a faux hawk or whatever it is you got going here. So I'll trade you. <laughs> yeah, you want to trade put you some a heartbeat. Of, yeah, like you could take some of that and you should put it on top of your head if you could. Yeah. And you're going to be doing I just like, be able to LA looks. I want to yeah. be able to use that stuff again. And you're going to like, so is that full on? You haven't like touched it since this all started? How long is that growth? Uh, aside from having to do a little bit of a mustache trimming because you know, it, was, it was getting into my soup, uh, this, this is... Friday the 13th, Friday, March 13th was the last time I touched it with a razor. Unbelievable. And how, when are you going to shave it? Do so, you know yet? Say again? When are you going to shave it? Do you know? Uh, it's going to be done in stages. So I, tomorrow it's going to, I'm going to transition from this to the, uh, I'm going to get rid of the chin and, and do the general Ambrose Burnside look. Nice. And then, and then just kind of let it go in stages till my wife tells me I have to sleep in another room and then, then it'll all go. <laughs> Smart. That's good thinking. Yeah. Um, all right. So I wanted to talk to you because I'd love to get the perspective about what's happening in the world of whiskey, especially from someone like you and the people at Whiskey Acres. You guys are what we would term as that craft distiller. Um, I've done podcasts in the past with Nick. Uh, Nick and Whiskey Acres, I do believe, has been in attendance at my charity event, Bourbon and Bacon, every year since it started back in 2015. So, um, you know, you guys are a younger distillery uh that has had to sort of adjust on the fly like everybody else but the challenges i think are greater for the craft distillers and that's why i wanted to get you on first and foremost i know you like many others when this all started two months ago you guys were full-on no more whiskey distilling it's all about hand sanitizer right sort of right so so you are right in that we did uh we, we focused a lot of our resources and staff on doing hand sanitizer but also with kind of a long look in mind, we, we kept a shift going for whiskey production because if we mothballed distilling for whiskey today, that means I've got nothing to sell in five years and, and we'd just be punting the problem. So, um, so we dedicated our, our head distiller to continue making bourbon. And then we took our, our second shift distiller, Eric, and, and our front of house team that runs our visitor center. And uh, they, they switched from smiling and making drinks to, uh, to smiling and filling jugs to fill with hand sanitizer and, and sending them around the country. And so, yeah, and I was going to say, where, do, where does that go? How does that get uh, sort of distributed out? Does the government have to come in and, you know, like, are there even government regulations on, on the hand sanitizer that you're making? Yeah, the, there are. The, so, you know, back up 10, 12 weeks ago, you know, we, we couldn't even legally produce a hand sanitizer. Uh, the, the government, the TTB, which is the governing body over uh, alcohol production, and the FDA eventually made some allowances for, for the taxation part to, to be, we wouldn't have to pay excise tax on, on um, alcohol used for, for hand sanitizer. And then the FDA modified some of the, the regulations. That there was an ingredient that you use to denature alcohol for hand sanitizer. And denature is just a fancy word for uh, making it taste awful so, so kids can't drink it. Uh, but there was one particular ingredient that that was impossible to buy. Uh, if you could find it, you had to buy a semi load of it. And and the reality is you needed a couple gallons of it. And so we we actually worked with our congressman who who reached out um, to the the task force in, in D.C. And uh, about a day later, they, they um, updated and eased some of the regulations. We still denatured the, the sanitizer, but we're able to do it with a product that was available. And, uh, and from that moment on, uh, we were you know, selling to, to local distributors, local retail partners, uh, donated uh, a whole bunch to health departments, police departments, fire departments, health uh, or hospitals, and then, you know, made, made what we call, you know, a fair sale to distributors. Uh, the most interesting call we got was, was from somebody calling on behalf of, of uh, Vice President Pence, uh, wanting hand sanitizer for the Secret Service. Mm. So um, we... <laughs> Our heads were spinning that day, and and uh, we were very proud that at the very beginning of this, we we saw this was a need uh, for the community as well as an opportunity for the business, and 
and got our ducks in a row to, to be able to do it in, in volume and, and do it efficiently and effectively. Is that continued, Nick, at this point, or is that sort of started to subside and the, the market has been um, sort of replenished with, you know, for a while there, it was like completely disappeared off the shelf. So what, what stage uh, of this are you guys still in, in terms of producing that hand sanitizer? Yeah. So panic buying has stopped. Yeah. That, 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 that's all, you know, just like you can go buy toilet paper today, right? Okay. You, you can get sanitizer today. Um, but what we're seeing is, is kind of, you know, stages, you know, two months ago, if I had any quantity and somebody was calling, they would buy it right now. Um, then it's changed to different people are buying it. So I'm getting calls from churches and barbers and schools. Um, restaurants are starting to call now. So instead of, you know, these giant purchases that are going to distributors to try, try to get to anybody and everybody, we're getting smaller purchases to, to more specialized industries. Um, you know, fr from our standpoint, we have inventory on hand and the ability to turn on production, you know, within a day if, if we see that there's a spike in need. Uh, but we have remarshaled our, our resources and staff to continue whiskey production. And, and we're focusing on a June 5th reopening of our outdoor space for, for cocktails. Well, that was good. That's good. Um, and, you know, let's transition to that. You had mentioned that when this all started and you started taking some of your resources that were maybe allocated to, you know, entertainment at the facility, uh, making cocktails for people, the front of house people, all of a sudden you don't need that. So let's, you know, reprioritize. We'll use these people to help make this hand sanitizer. Like that's a huge thing for craft distillers, isn't it? I was listening to uh, Bourbon Pursuit podcast and in the last couple of weeks, they were talking about how this affects craft distillers and it, they made it sure sound like a huge part of the revenue for you guys is getting visitors on site uh, to experience the distillery and the tasting facility, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the on-site experience, you know, we opened up a brand new visitor center in, you know, the beginning of 2019 um, that we're, st we're still paying a mortgage on that, yeah. that doesn't have a soul coming through. Uh, so, so it's a, it's very obviously a revenue generator and, and an integral part of our business. And, and probably just as importantly though, it's a marketing tool. You know, we, we build the brand starting with people's visit here and then they go out and, you know, they go home and, and call it the restaurant or pick it at the, the, the on, off premise location. And, and so, you know, we're going to see a gap of, of consumer awareness of our business because, you know, we, we've had several thousand people not come through here who would have in, in, in normal times. Beer and especially seems like it can withstand uh, almost anything, right? It's always going to sell. It's going to always do very well. Uh, off premise. What has this been like for a craft distiller when, yeah, you know, people can still go to the Binnie's and their local liquor stores and buy your product, but when they can't go maybe to their favorite restaurant and they're accustomed to having it or a great whiskey bar or whiskey restaurant and they want to try something new and they see whiskey acres and they can't do that. They haven't been for the last couple of months. How much does that affect your bottom line? Well, that's significant. You know, the, the, Again, it's, it's, it's revenue as well as, as marketing um, better than 50% of our sales. And, and I think it's probably true for most craft distilleries is, is what we would call off premise. So bars and restaurants, um, new consumers, new to the brand are way more likely to spend 10 bucks on a cocktail than 40 bucks on a bottle. So those off on premise uh, experiences are very important again to, to brand building and people becoming familiar with, with who we are and, and what we make. Uh, we're, we're, we have seen at very least uh, maintenance at, at the, the off premise sales, and in some cases, a, a little bit of a peak, but those bottles sold at off premise do not compensate for the lack of sales, which are, are literally zero at, uh, at on premise locations. Right. Uh, and you guys had a bottled and bond release that was supposed to come out in the spring, right? Uh, what, what has yeah. happened with that? And will that, you know, is Sitting that here? You, there it is. I thought you'd never ask, Carmen. There it is. <laughs> uh, we we uh, we were supposed to release that on, on uh, April fourth, and and for very obvious reasons, I think we uh, we parked it. Actually, the the folks from Benny's reached out and, and told us they'd be happy to continue to to support that that release at the time, but we decided that that because it's such a a core product to what we're going to be doing moving forward, we wanted to be able to to release it in in a little bit friendlier environment where it could be supported um you know we, i don't know if we're going to be able to support tastings and things like that the way we used to but 
we feel a little bit more free today and moving forward than we did on April 4th. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, we're opening our new space or reopening our space here, I should say on, on June 5th. And we're going to see how that goes, see how, how the, the opening and reopening of Illinois goes and, and try to pick a, a timely and strategic way to, to launch this into the market. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, beer makers. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad we're not in the beer business and, and having, you know, thousands of gallons of, of kegged beer that that's, you know, yeah. having the, the calendar tick on it. You know, folks ask Nick, what, what are you guys doing with, with your bourbon you were going to release? It's just staying in the barrel, you yeah. know? So it's just, it's getting a little bit extra time there to, to get a little bit more rounded and complex. So, so in, in the case of us, um, you know, the, the lack of revenue is a kick, but, but the, the product is maturing and will be, uh, be, it was, it was great when we were planning to release it. And then it's going to be even a little bit better when we actually do. That is one nice advantage. Uh, the bottled and bond has to be four years. Um, and so this, this initial release is going to be from like that first harvest you guys did when you opened. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, harvest, the harvest of 2014 and then a, uh, a distillation, uh, I believe it was spring of 2015. And, uh, you know, so bottled and bond for those who don't know, is all of the all the regulations for bourbon plus uh, distilled in the same season by the same distiller at the same distillery, bottled at a hundred proof, um, and the fact that that it came from the same harvest from the same farm uh, is a is a step change in in sort of discretion and 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 uh, details that most distillers won't be able to do. So we're really capturing you know, in the wine world they call it, call it terroir. Uh, we're re really capturing that from from the farm here and what we're putting into a bottle. Yeah, because it's just one harvest. That is, and is it going to be something that you guys continue? I mean, is this going to be like a yearly thing? It it will actually be a a twice yearly thing because twice you have two seasons. Okay, so gotcha. th there'll be two seasons against every harvest, so to speak. That's very cool. <laughs> and uh, so you know, go ahead. I was just going to say two more about the reopening there. Um, you know, you mentioned June fifth and. Did you guys have to put forth a, I mean, did you have to submit a bunch of stuff to the state? Um, how did that work when, and it's still different for, you know, the folks that are living in the city, but you guys are out in DeKalb. So uh, what were the, the steps necessary to show the state that you could safely reopen and that you could be uh, bringing people back out to the vi uh, visitor center if they s choose to visit? Well, honestly, uh we're, we're just, we're following directions that we're, we're given at, at this point, we're not having to do any, any reporting. Um, and, and so the basics of, of the, the directions we're given is you, you can't have more than 10 people in a building. And so we're, we're going to require folks to have masks to come inside and coming inside is, is to do a quick browse of our swag and bottles or use the restroom. That's it. So mm -hmm. we, we will not have an indoor bar to sit up, sit at, or, or anything like that. The biggest step, Carmen, was uh, was having the foresight about six weeks ago to to get on HomeDepot.com and order every piece of outdoor furniture we could find, right. and, <laughs> and so the the last week has been um, you know reading the manuals of assembling all this stuff. So so the rest of my team, as, as you and I are speaking right now, is assembling this stuff, and and we're we're gonna go map it out and and you know have tables spaced appropriately. We're gonna draw lines, you know, to yeah, we're we're gonna do everything we can to create the safest environment possible. Uh, and we ask that, you know, if folks do come visit uh, number one, be patient with us because this is not what we've primarily done. So, so our learning curve is, is zero to 60 uh, and, and be respectful of, of other guests too. You know, we're, we we want to have fun, but, but we would need to be safe. Number one. Uh, your rye uh, was awarded, um, you know, a nice accolade. A lot of your stuff has been over the years, but your rye recently, I think that was either, was that last year, the rye? Uh, 20, 2019 was named, uh, exactly. yeah. And, and actually, uh, I believe the rye has won a couple gold medals uh, since then as well at like San Francisco World Spirits Competition. And so it's... Uh, it's, fa it's fabulous. The rye is so good. The, like the benefit for you guys as a smaller craft distiller too, sometimes with the rye is that that rye can be like, I'll use the term turned around quicker. For whatever reason, there's something in the chemistry, right? Where the rye kind of like, start to take on that barrel more quickly than the corn. So even a younger rye uh, has, I guess you'd say a little bit more complexity, some more maturation 
Um, so those are like the added challenges of a craft distiller when it comes to bourbon and all that corn, but the rye seems to go quicker. Is that, and, and you guys use a special varietal too, but like, how is there such a dramatic difference sometimes when you taste a young bourbon versus a young rye? Uh, you said something like for some reason was the, that's, that's the best we've come up with so far is for some reason the, the rye ages out a little bit faster. And, and that's, that's kind of across every distillery. Um, but specifically to us, and you did bring it up, is we use a very specific varietal of rye that when it's distilled, it, it explodes with these vanilla flavors. It's much softer, has a, a nice like white pepper finish. And so putting in something that's bright and fruity and, and, and different than most ryes, um, you know, allows it to age out differently and, and you know, kind of earn the, the awards that I think it deserves. So, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of distilleries, and, and, and they should talk about the distillation process and the barrel aging process, and that is important. But ingredients matter too, and and being able to focus on on very specific ingredients and, and have some level of predictability because we know what we're using, as opposed to using a commoditized or homogenized grain source, really gives us the ability to to make high quality stuff very consistently. I see your shirt that you're wearing. I have one of those as well. Yeah, the women's t shirt. You get this. I love that. I there it can, is. Can we get rid of pit stains? I don't know if they're they're showing up there or not. Ah, I is... can't tell. I <laughs> they're there. I can guarantee you that. It's a great. Yeah. It's a great shirt. It's just a cool design. I bought one too, and especially that, like th tell everybody about that because this was designed for a specific reason for a very good cause, and there's a charitable arm to all of this. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned earlier that that you know our front of house team, which happens to be all all uh, gals really kind of stepped up and, and pivoted from running the front of the house to helping with us, helping us with everything that we needed uh, on the sanitizer side. And so um, every day they came in and, and bottled sanitizer for several hours a day. And, and in our conversations kind of likened what they were doing to the environment, the situation here to, to Rosie the Riveter. And so one of the gals stepped up and, and reached out and got, got this t-shirt design, you know, it's women of whiskey acres, kind of a, a harken to Rosie the Riveter on the back. This, this is a, a, a sample shirt. The one that you, uh, you would get if you order from us says sanitize local on it. And yeah. the back of ours usually says drink local. Uh, but we, we've sold several hundred of these and every net proceed of those, uh, the, the first $1,500 went to a, a program called Caring for the Caretakers where we, we essentially bought meals for uh, the frontline workers. And uh, after we, we did that, uh, we've sent at least $3,200 to the Northern Illinois Food Bank. Uh, and, and that organization, every dollar we give them, um, they can turn into about $8 worth of food for the needy. And so we're going to actually, sales of that shirt end the last day of, of May. Um, and so would, would really encourage folks to go out and get one of these, you know, kind of a, a snapshot of, of the times as well as really supporting a great cause. Uh, and you can get them. There's two really easy ways. If you go to our Facebook page, there's a shop now button that directs you directly to the, the, um, the, per the, the, the folks uh, that are selling it as well. If you go to our website, uh, food bank donations, uh, click that site and it will or click that link, I should say, and it'll take you to the, the page. It's a cool shirt and it's a lot great. of fun, great conversation piece. And, and I think most importantly supports a, a great cause. Yeah. The design's awesome. It's for a great cause. It really is great. Um, you feel pretty confident, Nick, like uh, in the business you're in through all this, and hopefully we're starting to slowly but surely come out of it, that you guys um, are, you know, set up where you can still thrive coming out of this. You made the point of like, hey, the one advantage is you can keep aging that whiskey and the more time in the barrel, the better, let's face it. Um, so like, what is the sort of short term outlook for you guys as a craft distiller coming out of all this? <laughs> what? Well you know, sort of an indirect answer to your question is, is when we were starting a distillery, everyone always said alcohol is recession proof, alcohol is recession proof. And, um, you know, I don't know what we're in. This is, this is very different than a normal recession. Uh, but, but what I can say is, is I can feel the pent up demand for people to, to engage with us and our brand and our people. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident that, that when, when people can leave their homes and, and comfortably come uh, and, and experience what we have to offer that we're, we're going to get on track pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also proud that, that when we had the opportunity to do something 
good for the community beyond just making whiskey that we did that. And, and you know, we've had visibility in, in front of a lot of eyes that, that didn't know we existed until they kind of saw a step up to, to be part of, of the, the protective gear program and, and, and making sanitizer and donating lots of places. So I think, I hope that we've kind of gained the respect of those who maybe weren't sure of us and then really uh, shown our value to the greater community and the greater good. And so I'm, I'm confident and excited for, for our next phase. I'm also, this, this kind of lines up really, you know, there's some good, positive and negative about this, but 2020 was the year that, that our business was kind of going to grow up. You know, the fact that we have a, a bottle and a bond made by us, you know, from scratch and, and can release it now was a big deal, is a big deal for our business. So we're um, really excited to be able to kind of capture that momentum and, and showcase what we've been working on for a long time. And, and so I think, I think those things really put us in a position to, to succeed. I was lucky enough to have a little sample of the bottle and bond. We all, like you said, thought it was coming out that first week of April and I think, I don't know, I sampled it in probably not too long before all of this started, actually, late February, early March. And uh, it's really good. It's got like a beautiful fruity. I had said right away to you when I, even before, you're going, I just nosed it. We didn't even taste it. And we were like, oh boy, big cherry on here. It's got yeah. that nice cherry bomb, you know, that yeah, it's got beautiful caramel. I mean, like it's, it's really good. And that's an exciting thing for you guys, I know for sure. But did it turn out to be like, everything you guys were hoping for basically when you first tried it. Carmen, if you liked it, what else did I have to ask? You about, right? <laughs> it's all that matters, right? <laughs> as long as you're, going that's out. right. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in the, yeah. When, when, when year 2013, when we incorporated, we said, we got to make sure Carmen likes it. That's it, man. And then that, you know, it's, it's, you, you, I don't want to say you're flying blind, but when, when you're putting white dog whiskey that you just made into a barrel uh, and, and cross your fingers and praying, but we did way more than that. You know, we built this distillery from scratch. You know, we did the work and spent the money to make sure we we're doing it right. So, you know, I, I joke in that, that we were crossing our fingers, but, you know, we worked under the, the sort of supervision of Dave Pickerel for, for our startup. And, and so we had the confidence knowing that what we were putting into a barrel was good and, and was going to be great when, once we got, got to where we are now. So. Did, I, did I see on the website, uh, website, Nick, that you guys started curbside pickup too? So we did curbside pickup last, uh, last Thursday and um, honestly in, intended to do it again uh, today, uh, but decided not to because it, about the day that we did curbside, the governor announced that, that we could do outdoor. And so in an effort, we could do curbside or we could put together outdoor patio furniture. <laughs> so so we're we're doing we're we're getting ready for the the uh, the outdoor opening next week. That's fabulous. Again, that's I should fabulous. say. Yeah, that's great to hear too that uh, people can get back out to the property and check it out. And like you said, you guys built that brand new visitor center not too long ago. Let, um, let me tell you a couple things though. So we are yeah. we are going to open up. Um, you know, we're 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 laying out kind of our grids for for how we're going to um, you know keep people socially distanced while they're being social. Um, <laughs> but we still have. If folks need sanitizer, um, they can they can come get it while we're open. If industry needs sanitizer in quantities, email us at info at whiskeyacres.com and we have we have supplies that we can we can get that out there to, to folks who need it. Um, and and I, my biggest request is is if if you do come out, be patient with us because this is this is new to us and and I don't know whether 50 people want to come or five. 500 people want to come and, and we are going to have to make the very discretionary decision at some point in time we're going to go there's enough people here if we get there and we're going to close and so uh if we have to do that you know it's it's, it's because it's the right thing to do not because we're trying to turn people away we just we don't know what to expect yet that's important to remember for sure so good luck with everything going forward nick you know we love you and uh, thanks for doing this i appreciate the time all right thanks for having me